everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first FOSS backstage um, and my first time in Berlin. Uh, <laughs> um, and my wife and I are really enjoying the food so far, so it's been great. Um, so you're here, and it was very clearly named Success Through a Thousand Emails. Uh, who all here likes emails? I, I will admit that I have been semi-successful and I am not good at emails. <laughs> so this is, uh, so one of the key tenets of this talk is that this will be a team effort. Uh, and although you can get success through a lot of emails, the, the emails is a little bit tongue in cheek of just a lot of uh, iterative communications uh, through your stake, to your stakeholders. So uh, you're in for a treat. So this is also for how to fund medium to large goals before you have community buy-in as well. So you're not going to be, uh, we're not talking about people or projects that are open source darlings and already um, have money thrown at them. These are uh, conversations where you're busy trying to convince people what you're working on is worth the effort, worth the time, worth the money. Uh, so there's three goals that I have for this presentation. The first of which is I hope that we have levels of people who are interested in uh, joining the sponsor conversation. It is usually reserved to people who are old hats in the community and still don't actually know what they're doing when they're going to ask for money. So it is incredibly intimidating for people who just want to join a team and start, and there's open positions on a sponsor uh, sub-team. I'm also interested in addressing uh, the way that we communicate with our larger audience it is going to be bulk of communication. There was an awesome presentation earlier today in, um, in Wintergarten uh, about where the money is going and who is it, go who is it going to. Uh, I am going to be talking about how all of those arrows are happening. Not where it's coming from and not where it's going to. Hopefully it's going to us. Uh, but really how, how that com communication can work. And this is going to be through a, a little bit of a marketing perspective, a little bit of sales perspective. <laughs> um, but we'll be using some of those, uh, some of those uh, terms in our toolkit. And then I also really hope we're building relationships and then qualifying those relationships um, and figuring out where to put effort um, in order to be effective and efficient. So why should you listen to me? I don't know, you don't have to. Uh, but my name's Dawn Wages. I am the chair of the Python Software Foundation for this year, and we'll see if it happens next year. Um, I'm on the board of directors, and I have another year left, and it's been a fantastic experience. Um, and that has given me a vantage this past uh, several years of a much larger organization um, with larger goals and relatively um, but truly using some of the same tenants that I've used in these smaller grassroots efforts. Um, I'm on the uh, core team for Wagtail CMS, which is a uh, small to medium, we're really proud of how big we've grown, but it's a CMS um, built on Django. Um, I've uh, started a Django mentorship program uh, with some really cool friends this past year and we're asking for money there too. So I have experience asking people for money. Um, also of several years of um, organizing events as well. Oh, uh, ask me about my co-op agency. We just started in 2024. We're very, very excited. It has nothing to do with this presentation. <laughs> so I wanted to do bottom line on top. Okay, so this is really the crux of the, car, um, the, the presentation. Uh, we have uh, blue is, uh, excuse me, purple is discussing relationships. We have blue that's gonna be talking about an identity first versus a service first approach. This is kind of more about messaging. Uh, then three, you are the authority. Yikes, I don't feel like an authority. How do I feel like an authority? Who do I talk to? And how do I get the big bucks from the people who hold the purse strings? Four, you want to build a budget that works with your goals, and then build a timeline that works with your budget. And I use that approach over and over again because it's worked for me and my brain, and if that's not how your brain works, there's flexibility. Take what, um, take what serves you and leave what doesn't. And then finally, it's a little bit of a cheat because the whole point is if you don't have buy-in yet, why would you have a big chunk of cash laying at your disposal? So I'm cheating a little bit, uh, but it does absolutely help to start with a big chunk of ca um, cash at your disposal. All right, so let's start with definitions. Uh, what is a medium to large goal? It's something you can't bootstrap. 
Um, and for those not familiar with the term bootstrapping, bootstrap is what you can spend with whatever your disposable income is. Bootstrapping for one is not going to be the same for bootstrapping with uh, for the other, but it means you're just you don't have a well of funds on your on your own. I know I cheated with number five, but it means you're you you're it's too big to bootstrap. And it's a this is going to stay really general because open source is so vast and multifaceted, and we want to do so many things. So it's a project, it's a program, it's an event, it's a feature. It's a John as a Philadelphian, as a like that's a noun, <laughs> uh, a little slang from Philly. Uh, so it's just it's a thing that we're doing in open source. Um, and then what's community buy-in? So as I mentioned, you are not the the industry darling yet. Uh, you don't have all of the buzzwords. You don't know. You're not part of the zeitgeist. You're really doing some of that convincing. So number one, relationships, relationships, relationships. I leverage. All of them, tell everybody, everybody and your mama, that you have something going on. If it's really important to you, you send out the mass emails and you apologize later. So this may be cultural as well. Uh, I'm American and I will send out an email if I need some help, okay? Um, but uh, don't be afraid to leverage your network. And also recognize that some of these communication styles are going to be high touch or low touch. So low touch is low effort, it is not qualified, it's a homie, it's a friend, but don't forget to send out that email because I've gotten some of my best connections and my most important um, opportunities from the most unexpected places. Uh, so definitely reach out to that group. And then the qualified conversations are going to be high touch. These are once you've decided or you figured out that these are the decision makers or they're sympathetic uh, parties who may be closer to the decision makers, um, or they're subject matter experts who can give you insight on how you're approaching it. So here's some of the messaging part. And truly, it goes into three categories, two categories with a caveat. Uh, that I've seen really, really successful. And so I am a Pythonista, um, as I mentioned on the slide as well. Uh, so these are my context and my frame of reference. And if you want to get money from Pythonistas um, and you feel like this group, this community, is one that is close enough knit to have a shared identity um, and, can, uh, and you can leverage that to be able to band together and, uh, and uh, go towards a goal, that is an identity first approach. So membership drives, for example, are very, very good for an identity first approach. You can also do a uh, service first approach. So the Python Software Foundation, we do PyPI, we do a lot, of, a lot of other kind of service oriented work. Many other models do service oriented work. And if your product or service or event or feature or thing uh, really does provide something for the community, stay focused in that mission and focus in that, uh, in that messaging to your in group. And I, I try to not mix the two so you can, people only have a few seconds to scroll through whatever you're telling them. So I try to remain between the two. But the third caveat, there's urgency. So you could say, everything's on fire, please give me money, we need it right now. And it works. I've seen it work, I've done it. <laughs> and, and it was an emergency. And I don't wanna tell people to not uh, say to your audience that you need help right now if you need help right now. But you will, uh, if you do set the alarms too many times, you're going to erode those relationships. So if you are part of the identity as a Pythonista, and if the Python Software Foundation said exclamation points every week, I will feel um, burdened by that relationship. I may feel alienated by that community, and I may not feel like I want to keep coming back. I may not feel like a Pythonista if I'm always at need, but I also don't feel in control of the ship, right? Ship's always on fire, but I'm not steering it. I don't know, maybe I should leave the ship. Uh, also with the service first approach, right? So if you pro are providing a functionality, but there's always something on fire and an exclamation point, uh, you may not feel uh, like that, that investment is going to be sustainable, and you're going to want to look into that strategy. You're going to want to know who's driving the ship. You're going to have a lot more questions before you can rely on what that's doing. 
Oh, and I also want to highlight that some of these are marketing kind of conversations. So there's in-group with identity first, and then with service, uh, service first, we also call that kind of value-based marketing, or excuse me, uh, value-based marketing. It's the value that you are providing to your um, end users. But if everything is not fine, don't say it's fine. You should ask for help. So it's a, it's a balance. So what about ways to amplify your message? These are uh, maybe arrows that I'm going to supply, supply for you. So you can provide an audience with an information. You're, you have a blog, but you, you want to be kind of a source of information in this, on this first one. Uh, you can also make sure that you are including your audience in making the decision so they feel like they're uh, steering that ship. Demonstrate that you understand your audience's needs or you are aligned with subject matter experts. That puts a huge uh, megaphone on, in front of your face. You could also gather feedback from your stakeholders. This is kind of a little bit reiterative of the, the other approaches as well. Um, but those are kind of the, the differentiating factor is that they are people held in high esteem as well. Um, and, and they also rely on some of the output of whatever your product is, maybe. Um, but may not necessarily be your audience. You can also make sure that your audience trusts you. So you can be earnest and endearing and straightforward. And that, as I'm just like naturally an earnest person, that comes naturally to me. So I love the earnest first approach. I love uh, kind of being a face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to my my end audience and say, hey, let's make let's be friends, let's make a relationship, and then talk through it. Um, those also require a lot more touch points in order to be able to do that. So that is a high touch relationship. Um, and also be discoverable. It, it shouldn't be last because it is one of the most important, but you should be in all of the channels that your end audience is. So figure out where they hang out and hang out there too. So now you are the expert. You are in front of the big wig, the top dog, uh, the person who is close to the purse strings, and you want to figure out how to navigate that conversation, and you know your idea is good. You know your project is good. Well, that person who is likely aligned with you on uh, in motives and incentives uh, may not be able to sell that up several levels. So you want to reduce the I'm going to get yelled at factor. So. Uh, as someone who is part, uh, who works at a megacorp and has talked to meta megacorps in order to get their dough, these are some of the things that they have in their meetings, and this is absolutely not an exhaustive list, but these are the things, the common gotchas that I've come across that kind of tank some of my conversations. So learn from me. Uh, the vanity metrics matter because they're easy to measure. So give an opportunity to provide vanity metrics to your uh, to the companies or to the large big wigs who uh, may be signing the checks. You should also, uh, in your strategy, have opportunities for uh, that end organization, that partner, to show off their services and their features or their tools or initiatives. You should baked into the design of per, a prospectus, for example, should have that opportunity. You also need to make sure that you have accountability and a solid structure. So that's going to be like finding a fiscal home. And it's all of these various tools are going to have different levels of accessibility to the person who is trying to raise the money and also a different uh, uh, viewpoint from the person who's going to be sending the money on how trustful, worthy, and, um, and viable it is to send money in that. And I wanted to underscore that in uh, marginalized uh, communities, in underrepresented countries or continents, uh, it is harder to find resources or find that fiscal home. That's going to meet the checkbox of this large, lofty organization with really large coffers. And I would, uh, this is also going to come up in the, later in the presentation as well, but I behoove every one of you, whether you feel like you are close to the purse strings or not, to right now do the research, re, do the research on what the barriers are to give money to, for example, um, a foundation in Africa. 
uh, because when you get to those intense conversations with an organization that you really want to align with and you really want to uh, give money to, and then in that moment, that's when you're figuring out your company policy needs X, Y, Z, all of these receipts, only this type of bank account, you are doing a disservice to the organization that you really want to help. And sometimes it ends when there's a time uh, timeline crunch where you're like, sorry, I can't help, I really wish. And the next time might go better, but do that research right now. If you know that that's aligned in your values and your interests, do that work. Also, if you're organizing the, um, organizing the project, the thing, the John, uh, you want to have a detailed budget. That's not something you want to go squirrel away later and then come back with the results when someone asks. You want to have that at the top. And uh, do yourself a favor for the next year or the next group of organizers. You want to have a, a detailed, it says post-event, but just kind of like a replay um, on uh, what happened. So if the tools you're already using, like for example, GitHub is going to track the stars over time or track the pull requests over time, that's great, it's baked into the tool. But if it's not tracked um, already, then you want to uh, make sure that you're tracking that. Find the decision maker. Write a compelling subject line or body copy. This is cultural, as I mentioned, um, and uh, will take different shapes and forms, and you really should just reach out and figure out what, what is best for the scenario. I can't give su concrete suggestions on it. I always think that the less verbose it is, the better it's going to be, but sometimes a one-line email to the right person is going to intrigue them and gives off a level of confidence um, that might be better and more useful than several bulleted paragraphs, um, bullets and paragraphs of what you think they might want to hear. Start the conversation. You're doing great. Uh, you want to make sure that you're solving their problem, so if you are going to just do one line, make sure that one line is going to solve a problem for them. Show your value and why they should choose you, so have your ducks in a row and uh, look as official as possible. But if you're a ragtag group of friends and you're just trying to uh, get another friend to hang out with you, that's also great um, and is a, is a value add because it's who you are and it's authentic to your group. Um, and then follow up ASAP. As I mentioned, I'm not great at emails. Uh, so I love to do these things as a team. So my teammates are great at emails. I'm good at one email. A lot of emails are not great. So if you're building a budget that aligns with your goals and you're building timelines that align with your budget, what I've gotten from my experience uh, freelancing as a software engineer, um, I love good, better, best proposals on my scope of works and my proposals with my clients. So I've adopted that with a lot of different aspects of my life. And I've uh, put it on this slide because I really think that can continue to help. So I have some example uh, goals. For example, this one is providing an equitable mentorship program. The good, better, best of it would be uh, regular administrative costs uh, and website logo and design. You want to get better. You want to pay contributors, maybe. And then you want to get better, better. You want to get best. You will maybe have an equipment stipend, for example. Um, and those are one, two, three dollar signs. Figure out what those dollar signs kind of look like. And it's just going to be a guesstimation process. But the exercise at the very beginning of your, of your workflow is going to be helpful and will elucidate a lot of ideas that may become uh, barriers down the road. And then give it a timeline. So the first one, I, I think I could bootstrap. The second one might take me some six, six months or so. I need a year to really plan the best. And I think I'm doing myself a service by doing this exercise in the very beginning because I don't want to be burnt out because I have an amazing idea. Another one, let's do an event. Uh, good, better, best. Virtual only. Uh, I could do that in a year. Uh, maybe better. I want to have uh, in person uh, in a secondary city, uh, two days of talk, two keynotes, travel grants. That's going to take me maybe two years. These are all guesstimates. I don't. I don't exactly know. But like in my gut, I think that might take me two years to plan. And then the the last one, maybe the best would be travel for underrepresented minorities and speakers and all the works. 
That might take me a while. So just go through that process, and this was an example of, of two of the different ones. And the reason why I brought out events is because events are a beast, and they're really hard. They require that money show up at the very beginning because you have to put deposits on things. It's just like just never ending. As soon as you set a date, you, you, you kind of have to meet some of these deadlines unless you're making relationships and you're in a little bit more flexible environment. So it's hard to understand what success looks like. And then also when you have enough to say, okay, let me put out a date and let me spread it on my socials. So thank you organizers. You did this whole exercise for us to be here. And as I mentioned, it's my first backstage, uh, FOSS backstage, and it's my first time in Berlin and you've made it a wonderful experience. So I appreciate that. So shout out to the organizers. Yeah. <laughs> so the best and most organized teams that I've uh, worked on had these five things and in this kind of-ish order. There's a lot of commas in here too and there's a lot of ands. So it's more than five things, but this is kind of like this rough estimation. Uh, we wanna start out with the mission, budget, and goals. As, I've, as I mentioned, let's try that good, better, best scenario. I love when we start out our initiative with a meeting cadence and positions. I love having a short list of what we expect a communications coordinator to do. I love when we have a short list of what we think the, the financier, treasurer, whatever you want to put in for that word is going to do. Um, and I think that helps it and it can change over time and that's fine. Uh, I love a checklist and prospectus that also gives us a guideline on where we're going. Uh, prospectus is going to be kind of the term that you're using when you're doing sponsorship for events many times, um, but it is just a very, well, I like making them pretty, but it is kind of a um, give and take of that relationship of you give me uh, a banana and I give you visibility for your, your goals. And uh, delegate responsibilities, that's important where it's gonna help uh, minimize burnout and uh, also create a feedback loop so you know what's not working and how you can iteratively improve uh, your fundraising approach. And like I mentioned, this is a little bit of a cheat because when you have a chunk of cash, that also means that you had buy-in and the whole point of this presentation was that you didn't have buy-in yet. Start trying to get that big buy-in early. It just alleviates so much. So try some partnerships. I know some events that I've started and organized um, couldn't have happened if I didn't know a, a sister event that was also organizing. They uh, want uh, PyCon Tanzania decided to not do a year so they could help DjangoCon Africa get off the ground. It was a wonderful, wonderful community loved uh, service for us and I appreciate that. Uh, complimentary or umbrella organizations, for example. You can also do Kickstarters and GoFundMes. I love Kickstarters because you can send the money back if it doesn't um, manifest and there's nothing wrong with it not working out. You did something, you learned something, you gained something in the community, gained something as well. So I, I think it's fantastic to try. It is an iterative approach and we are all growing in this, um, in this endeavor. So try to reach for the stars on these things. And there's also grants. So I hope you're reaching out to the grant programs that are local to your area that fit in the, in the parameters of your, uh, of your project. So last slide, here's some do's and don'ts. First, ask for help. We don't want that burnout. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Don't let a big goal impact your health. We do not want torn pieces, shells of humans in the wake of this fantastic goal that you've reached. Uh, we want whole humans at the end and it's not sustainable to invest in the community and then not be yourself at the end of the investment. We want you to stay here. Uh, so as you're doing these things, you need to set boundaries and failure is never a failure because it is a, another step to success and iterating on a more improved approach. Uh, do get Western donations to African initiatives. I've mentioned it twice. This comp presentation is not at all about getting Western donations to African initiatives, but it's really important to me. And I hope anyone who has aligned values um, can uh, do some noodling on how you can do uh, your part on that as well. Don't ignore the tax implications of your funding products, uh, projects. So your first first step, I guess, I gave a lot of first steps, but your first dish step uh, should be finding a fiscal home and you should do that before you receive your first dollar. I know that from a mistake I've made. Taxes suck. Um, also do create the next wave of sponsors and leaders in open source. So in that vein, I think the slides where you're talking about 
um, how you're delegating responsibilities, how you're having those communications, your um, iterative and meeting schedule. Um, those really show from the entire uh, boundary of the project uh, how it works. So leaders coming after you will know what it looked like when they did it. I only did this part, but I know what the whole boundary of it. So I might be able to do a little bit more next time. And I can be a leader in an open source initiative and funding projects uh, a few more times after that. That's it. Any questions? What do you think about the GitHub Sponsors program? I think it's great. I mean, I, from my vantage, I've seen it result in good things. Um, I would really, I'd be interested in having a more detailed conversation of someone who's went through it, but I think it's great. And I, I send money out into the ether. More, more, more. <laughs> The last one, we're running out of time. Great, thank you, that was an awesome talk. Um, so I have a question on this slide where you kind of did like an overview of successful projects that you had worked with and like what they have in common. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is like with these processes, are those already in place or you know, is it like the project is kind of a successful thing or do you have to nudge them towards adopting these or like, I guess, what does the picture look like? Yeah, yeah, it. it's been different for different projects. So uh, as an organizer of DjangoCon US, I think I had such a lovely uh, uh, learning curve. And that's one of the structures of like how I felt comfortable to do it again. Um, because they do a process of every two years, they have the same organizing team, and then they switch cities. Um, and then they have extensive documentation. And they're also very, very welcoming on the types of people who contribute, so it's not just uh, technical people in the code aspect, so Django, the, uh, the Python web framework. Um, it, they're just a very big tent friendly group, so people who are excellent writers have done the work um, in previous years of having extensive documentation, and then we iterate over those. Uh, so that one was a really great uh, lesson, but then in other approaches, I'm like, where's our, where's our budget? People are asking for our budget. That's not my responsibility, let's do that. Uh, so it does take a nudge, but it, it took me seeing something work pretty well to know that this might be getting off the rails pretty soon. And it's tough to do that if you don't have that experience beforehand, but this is what the slide was supposed to be for, so I'm glad you liked it. All right, thank you, Don, for a great talk. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Thank you, it's a pleasure.